There are many things that I like about my job and I think first and foremost is the fact that when I come to work I know that I'm truly making an impact in my community and I'm, I'm able to give back to the community and I'm able to serve the community and for me that's really rewarding. The other thing that I like about the job is it's exciting. My name is Mike Dombrowski and I've worked for the Napa Fire Department for almost 27 years. You know it's a good place to grow up. It's been kind of small town still, kind of slow, but friendly people, good environment. My name's John Hare, and I'm born and raised here, so 36 years now. Grew up here my whole life. So my dad's originally from Sonoma, and this family's been here since the, I want to say the 30s or so. Quite a while. <laughs> well, what I do is mechanical-wise, the machinery and, and, and the field works and that, so I'm, I'm the one that gets his hands dirty. This is the only thing I've ever known in, in, the, in the country. Well, Napa, you know, it's charming. And this neighborhood was really great to grow up in. We moved to this property when I was nine, and I went off to college when I was 17, and then moved back to Napa, I guess I was about 30. I grew up in the country, in, in Maine, and so the sooner we moved to Napa, the happier I was, especially once we got this, this house, because we're out in the country, and it's quiet. Enjoy it. Lots of wildlife. It just feels peaceful out here, you know? It's, it's, I like this neighborhood. It's, it's quiet. It's been, it's been good. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tracy Foley. And I'm Jeff Foley. The morning of the fires, it was a beautiful fall morning, nice and calm, average day here at the firehouse. And we noticed about lunchtime that the winds were starting to pick up. I remember early in the day there was a there was a fire at the salvage yard. Firefighters will work through the night to monitor a fire near the Napa airport. It was an auto yard fire that had burned over a um, hundred cars. We spent most of the afternoon into the evening hours on that fire. Other than that, it was just kind of a typical day. I remember the fire out there, and you could see the smoke, you kind of smell it. And nothing really extraordinary until the wind started picking up that night. And I mean, it was, it was blowing pretty good because the windows would rattle in the house. We get a lot of wind coming through here free, you know, several times a year. But this was unlike any other wind I've ever felt. It felt like the house was going to be ripped right off the ground with that wind. They had dispatched the fire up in the uh, Atlas Peak area. I remember talking with my crew about the fact that that's probably going to be really ugly due to the winds. After hearing the initial report from the first engine on scene of the Atlas fire, realized very quickly that that was in fact true. I told my crew, get your gear on, we're headed that way. Within 20 minutes, we were actually on the fire. God, it was probably 10, 30, 10 o'clock or so in the, in the evening. And, uh, my girlfriend was going to bed. She was closing all the windows in the house. You got a kind of better view around, see around out all the windows, and like start looking the, out. That way, Atlas Peak, where the first fire was, and you could start to see red. I'm like, what, what's going on? I actually went to Facebook, Napa Fire and Crime or something like that page, and and people were posting, you know, fire in Atlas Peak. Good thing I was awake. I got to the front window and that's when I noticed the flickering glow up on that ridge up there. It was still pretty far away at that point when I first noticed it. And I even took a, like five minutes to sit on the front steps thinking, where's it going? Is it gonna 
be blown away from us or is it going to be blown towards us? I don't hear any sirens. I don't hear any helicopters. I was waiting for all that before I realized, you know, I was hoping we'd be rescued, you know, from having to evacuate, but there was nothing. There, nothing came around to help. I woke up Jeff and he came up and woke up my parents. When, when I came up to get Chuck and Bonnie out of bed and I got them up and in the car when I came back, the fire was all the way along that whole entire ridge and the wind was just coming over the hill and you know how it was pushing it right down. It was down. coming down fast. We were gone probably like 15 minutes after we noticed it. I was trying to gather as many photo albums and photos as I could because I had a feeling that's all I was going to have after this. It was going to be difficult to get everybody out of that area. So we knew immediately that uh, most likely we were going to lose some lives. So our primary responsibility when we got to the fire was evacuation, at which time um, we were hit by the fire front, ended up having to turn around, work our way back down the hill. And so as we were turning around, we heard a cry for help. She was approximately 60 years old and she was uh, on the golf course side, wasn't able to get out on her own. So we helped her over the fence and uh, we rushed her into the engine um, with the fire front coming and were able to drive her down the hill and get her to safety. So that happened in the first 15 minutes. After that, we just continued to focus on uh, evacuations for some time. So the first thing I did was actually called uh, a buddy of mine, Tony, who lives on Atlas Peak. I sent him a message like, hey, you guys okay? And then we drove over to uh, Vintage out where it dead ends on Trower there. And so we're sitting there and you can start seeing the flames shoot over the hill and we were sitting there when one of the news vans pulled up. After that happened, I actually called my mom just to let them know. I was gonna say, it's probably 11 o'clock or so. Tell her, you know, big fire over here. Because that's the only one I knew of. My mom sent me a picture out the back window of their house. Went to bed about nine o'clock and my wife woke me up and said, I need to look at, the, come out and look at this. And that's when I looked out the kitchen window. So that's when I knew we were in trouble. So I was like, oh crap. That was kind of, you know, that's when I'm like, I didn't even know it was out there. So I was like, you need to leave. I know my dad wouldn't leave. He's gonna stay and try and save property in the fire, you know, all the equipment, everything. Get stuff, you know, get, get in whatever, you know, important documents, pictures, whatever, get in the truck and go. I get dressed and I get in the Honda and I go out towards the highway. I, I see a fire like I've never seen before in my life and the winds that were driving it were unbelievable. There were literally millions of embers. It, it was like being sandblasted. I, I've never saw anything like that. I hope I never do again. The creepiest thing, you know, the smoke blowing, it's the red skies, and the winds were shaking the car, and I got up there to their house and got my mom and a couple of the dogs, and she had a truck, and I finally I talked her out of it, and she followed me back into town, brought her here, left her. My dad had, by that point, got one of our one of the work trucks in a 500 gallon water tank and they were using that to spray down. And I stayed with my dad and uh, we had a couple of friend, family friends that had come out to help out. So the five of us, we had shovels and like you say, we had a small, couple of small sprayers that were hooked up so we could utilize them. Kind of putting out hot spots as we was trying to jump into the vineyard. Luckily, vineyards work as a really well as a firebreak. They don't burn that well. And we were just trying to protect buildings, especially this house here, the rest of them are pretty well isolated from the fire because the vineyards are all around them. I thought that we had a very good chance of, of being burned down. Uh, it was 25 yards from the house or so, 20 yards from the back of the house, but luckily there wasn't a lot of fuel for it to burn. I mean, 1.30 I got there and I left at 6.30 or so. It was, it was intense down there. I was worried about our safety from the moment we uh, responded to the incident. Um, we've trained for these types of fires for years, and we had a lot of close calls that night. You know, it was difficult because you had heavy smoke conditions. They couldn't see very well, and um, there were a couple times where we almost got hit by cars alone. I definitely feared for our safety, and, and I was lucky to have a really good crew that night, and we all looked out for each other like we should have. We went down the hill where everybody kind of met at the end of Soda Canyon Road at Soda Canyon store in the parking lot there. And then um, Tracy's like, oh, I didn't get our box that has like passports and documents, documents <laughs> and things like that. And so I drove back up and, and got that. 
by the time he came back down, and you were only gone for like 10 minutes, it was just smoke and, and um, sparks were flying everywhere. So everyone had to evacuate the parking lot. So we all just went further into town. And I went over to Big Ranch Road and parked and looked up, and I could tell that the neighborhood was just engulfed. I, I think one of the things that touched me is just seeing people trying to flee. The urgency of just knowing that if they weren't able to get out, that most likely they were going to die. You know, that isn't something that we're used to seeing. And that, that's something that really has stuck with me. Tried to find a hotel room, but nobody would take anybody with pets in town. They ended up just sleeping in their cars at the Marriott parking lot. And I actually had to go to work. So I did. I went to work and I came back and they were all sleeping in their cars. And we went on from there looking for hotel rooms, basically. There was a day, I think it was like three days later, when you could come up but not in your own car. You had to have a police escort. Yeah, because basically, like, we're going to look for pets. I had my turn, so he dropped me off in front of the Van Andreessen's on the opposite side. He said, you have 60 seconds to find your pets. Right, so I ran over, and I just, with my phone, just there was a big fence, so I couldn't even get on our actual property, and that was the first time I had seen anything, and I just started snapping photos. I knew the night we left that we weren't going to have a house. The neighbor called, and so he was letting all the neighbors know that all their homes were gone. So he, he gave me a call, let me know. So we knew the next day. About 40 years ago, Chuck and Bonnie Delormier moved into this home with their three children. This would have been the front entrance here, and then there would have been a couple of stairs that went up to three bedrooms and two baths. I kind of felt like a zombie for like a month. Oh yeah, it was like... Like just in disbelief. It was hard to even react because it was just, I was numb. Yeah. I just couldn't feel anything. Couldn't even feel, I mean, I felt sad, but I couldn't, I, I don't know, maybe it was denial. I, don't know. I, I came up here every day looking for stuff, so you'd think it would set in, but I think that also helped me get used to it. I was just coming up every day and digging. I, I wasn't able to get any of our home videos. I did get all but about five years of our photos. So I'm missing some of the best years. They were all good years, but when the girls were little, all the five years of those photos from that time are gone. Unfortunately, Napa's um, had its fair share of natural disasters. We've had significant earthquakes in recent years. So unfortunately, you know, the community has been forced to learn how to deal with these disasters. But fortunately, the community is resilient. They've learned very quickly that how important it is for them to come together and work together to get through these types of events. It's great to see people coming together and helping their neighbors. You know, every, everyone afterwards, you know, kind of went through your stuff and donated clothes and whatnot. And the amount of stuff people were donating and the time and it was impressive. I mean, everyone came together and there was the, the pop-up place in uh, River Park for people who come and get clothing and stuff for free or affected by the fires. I mean, it was really impressive how much everyone came together and looked out for people. Like a few days after the fire, we were in a restaurant. They're both coaches at, at the college here. And they just overheard us talking and they paid for our dinner without us even knowing. People have been giving us clothes and things. and literally had just the clothes on our backs and you know it was a long haul to be able to just be able to park a fifth wheel on our own property you know but b being back here has been very helpful. Napa's always been real supportive of their public safety both fire and, and police and fortunately we've always had a, a lot of support from the community. Now that said, I will say that this incident has brought that support to a new level that I don't think I've ever seen. I don't think there was an inch of space on our counter from all of the desserts and treats and food that the community was bringing us. They were very grateful and very appreciative of, of our efforts. That's pretty special. We moved here right before Christmas, like three weeks before. Our daughters were coming home for Christmas. They hadn't been here since, you know, since before the fire. We were very busy getting ready for Christmas. We had a Christmas tree and we kind of created an outdoor area. So that kept us busy, kept our minds off of it and having the girls home was fantastic. 
we just got busy planning our new home. It's going to be a different house in a different part of the property. And so that's been helpful to kind of keep our minds off of losing stuff. So. And it's going to be a nicer house. Pretty excited about it. Our focal point used to be we'd sit and look up at all these oak trees and they're all gone. So now our focal point is out that way, looking at the beautiful hills over there. You know, in the fire service, we always talk about major incidents, significant incidents being career fires, something that you would never experience again during your career. Nothing compared to this particular incident. We experienced the full power of Mother Nature that night. But after an incident like this, I mean, this was, um, not only did it draw me and my crew together, as we really had to rely on each other and look out for each other, really vital that, that we did that. And so I was really, I'm really fortunate that I had a good crew and, and I'm thankful for that. I think more importantly though, I, I think that this fire will, will, will stick with me the rest of my life just because of the impact that it had on me and not only the incident itself, but seeing how the community has really come together and, and really looked out for each other and not only in the rebuilding process, but the healing process. And, and so that's really encouraging and makes me even more grateful to be able to serve the community.